for a lot of people, it must feel like they're on a ship at sea in a storm, not knowing how it's going to end. That's how it must feel for billions of people on this planet as we speak, uh, as we gather here today, if you see what's going on around the world. Everywhere you look, you see the impact of the crisis of capitalism. And we are fortunate, comrades, because as Marxists, really, I mean, I know some people think we might be boasting, but we are the only ones who fully understand why this is happening, why it's happening. You get some serious bourgeois analysts who come close. They reach the same conclusions as us from a class point of view. The problem is they're on the wrong side of history. Now, the war in the Ukraine highlights what I just said. The question is this, why is it happening now? Well, you could have the approach of who started it. We're in a school, you know, so go out in the playground and a couple of us, you know, push each other around. You started it. No, you didn't. I did. You did that. And you end up in a fight. I've had a few some years ago and I remember what it was like. And you have to work out who started it. That is a pointless question when it comes to war. Because the world is pregnant with war as it is pregnant with class struggle and revolution. Um, in a capitalist world, it's uh, inevitable that you're going to have wars. There's no point saying, oh, how terrible. Oh, what a terrible world we live in. Oh, what a terrible event. It's very, very terrible. Yes, of course it is. Millions of people are dying um, every year because of wars, because of hunger, and because of the general crisis of the system. What we have is a crisis of overproduction, which has been ongoing for years. Basically, the system as a whole has built up productive capacity to a degree that the world market cannot absorb what the system potentially can produce. The markets are not big enough for all the producers, for all the powers. I'm not going to give you an, a lesson in Marxist economics. I'm sure you do that in your branches. And you see the contradiction of the capitalist system means that it tends to increase production to the point where there's too much. Not because there's too much food. There's lots of hungry people around who need the food. Not enough people with the money to buy the food. That's how capitalism works. Um, but in a situation like this, one, in order to sell more, somebody else has to sell less. That means globally, the powers encroach on each other's spheres of influence. They push against each other in an attempt to conquer more markets, more spheres of influence. You see it China, with China versus the United States in the Pacific, in the South China Sea. Taiwan is a potential similar to situation to what we're facing in the Ukraine uh, today. Um, you see it in the conflict between India and China on the border. Brexit was a product of precisely what I'm just talking about now. And what we have is also a polarization globally between countries. You have certain countries emerging as extremely powerful, others not so, and also between the classes within each country. Before this war broke out, we had the growing tendency towards protectionism, where all the major blocs were increasing protectionist measures to protect their own markets against the imports of other powers. You have this conflict even between the so-called allies of NATO the North Americans and the Europeans are in conflict over markets. Um, in normal times, capitalists compete through the mechanisms of the market. You invest, you increase productivity, you sell more if you're more productive. But the tendency at a certain point reaches the degree of competition can no longer be sorted out by normal means of competition. And the next step is war. And capitalism is a history of wars. Now, 
as a consequence of what's happening in the Ukraine, we have the tendency towards rearmament of countries which previously were far less armed, for example, Germany and Japan, are now preparing to massively increase arms production with the excuse of security. But you know, you know how much is spent every year on arms? Two trillion dollars every year is spent on arms. The United States represents 40% of that. The United States spends more on military spending than the next nine powers um, put together. The second power is China um, with 250 billion, but the, the, uh, the Americans 800 billion. Now, $2 trillion on weapons, that is the annual GDP of Italy which is one of the G7. That's how much wealth is spent on weapons. These are the priorities clearly of the capitalist class. Do you remember, you're very young, so I don't know if you remember Brexit. Um, <laughs> the Leave campaign claimed that with 350 million pounds a week, which they said were being spent, you could build a hospital. Do you know how many hospitals you could build with $2 trillion? I've done a rough calculation. 3,000 hospitals could be built. The wealth, the wealth of the world about four or five years ago was $280 trillion, half of which was in the hands of 1%. That's $140 trillion in the hands of 1%. If you divided that up by the world population, it would be $20,000 for each one of us. You could solve the problems of the world tomorrow morning with those resources. There would be no need for poverty. And yet we have poverty, we have hunger, millions of refugees, wars and destruction. That's because we live under capitalism, obviously. The situation on a global scale is also producing changes in relations between the powers. One of the reasons why we have a growing level of tension and war is that the big bully on the playground isn't as strong as he used to be. As we're in a school, you know what happens. The big bully usually attracts some, some rather nasty individuals who are not really powerful themselves, but they gather around the big bully. And he manages to keep a certain control. The Americans are still the big bully, as I showed with the figures on, on military spending, but, they have been somewhat reduced in the power and influence they have. And that explains certain things that are happening around the world. For instance, Boris Johnson goes over to Saudi Arabia and tries to convince them to increase the production of oil. Um, the Arab Saudis are not too keen on that because they have other interests, but they made a deal with China. Um, the Saudis themselves are, are an example of a minor power behaving more independently and distancing from the states. Um, what's happening in Europe is, in spite of all the talk about the unity of Europe around U the war in the Ukraine, there are actually very serious divisions inside Europe. Germany and France are still now desperately trying to uh, reach some kind of deal over the Ukraine because they're absolutely terrified of the economic um, consequences. China, what's happening with China is clearly, it's being shown, although a rising power, its weaknesses are very uh, clear in the present situation. China depends heavily, heavily on two major markets, Europe and North America. They're the two, by far the two biggest markets of, um, um, the Chinese, and they at the same time have a kind of geostrategic, geopolitical alliance with the Russians, and they're trying to play in different in different directions, and they're being pulled. The Chinese don't like this war because they like the conditions where you just get on with business and you sell and make a profit. But the, the, unfortunately for them, that's not so easy. You have a ch changing relations between the powers because of this situation. Um, as I said, Germany um, is seeking a way out. Why? Well, it's okay for the Americans to tell the Germans 
you've got to find an alternative source of gas when more than half the gas you consume comes. Didn't like what I said. <laughs> What's going on? Ah, okay, I thought it was. I thought it was like catchwords. I said the wrong word. Yeah, um, and now that's really thrown me. Um, I'll move on anyway. Now, Lenin, if you've read Imperialism, his famous book, he explained that already when he was writing that book, the world was completely divided up, so that in the future only redivision is possible. These are Lenin's words. That meant the growth of one imperial power can only take place at the expense of another, because all the whole world has been um, sucked into the system. That's what we have taking place before our very eyes, comrades. The conflict in the Ukraine is an example precisely of that. The, unit, the Soviet Union collapsed, Eastern Europe was sucked in, most of it was sucked into the European Union eventually, capitalism. Russia was very weak. Western imperialism took advantage and spread its influence far to the east, right up to the borders of Russia. In the meantime, Russia began to recover strength, began to um, seek to reconquer some of the spheres of influence it had lost. And we've seen that behavior in several parts of the world. And now the most recent one is the Ukraine. A minor power telling major powers, so far and no more. And he's pushing back, trying to win back spheres of influence. This is the way capitalism has always worked. This explains the First World War. It explains the Second World War and many, many other wars which have taken place um, since then. Now, you could say it's an evil man. You could say it's due to a liar, a bully, a thief, a maneuverer, a gangster. You hear all of this, or oh, the devil incarnate, even, I've heard say. Who am I talking about? Putin, maybe, yeah. But it could be Boris Johnson. It could be Macron. It could be Xi Jinping. It could be Biden. It applies to all of them, that, that description. Um, all of them um, are facing serious internal problems in their own countries because of the pressures of the capitalist system. And war also has certain advantages. You see, it's terrible, but it's also terribly useful. When you're facing a collapse in popularity ratings like Boris Johnson, and everybody's talking about Partygate, a nice little war across the, the channel in, in the heart of Europe, comes useful and then you can fly around and show what a great statesman you are. Um, there's another joke running around which I've heard that Putin should be given the Nobel Prize for medicine. You know why that is? Because he's cured the world of COVID. Nobody talks about COVID anymore. It's all about the war. But all of them have their problems. Russia, for example, unemployment is growing. It's at the highest for the last eight or nine years. Real incomes have been falling. Inflation before this crisis started was over 8%. Um, the economy has been stagnating for the last seven or eight years. Um, and um, incomes have been declining since at least 2014. Um, and with that, the popularity of Putin was also in decline. Depends on the different opinion polls, but it was definitely in, um, uh, in decline. Um, on top of all this, now Russia is going to be hit by the sanctions. They're calculating that it, you could be looking at something like a 10% fall in Russian GDP. Um, interest rates have doubled from 10 to 20% because of the impact of this, of this situation. Um, and Russia is facing a serious economic crisis, but it was already facing it prior to the war. This is just going to add to it. Now we have Russia risking default, not because they don't have the money. They have the money. You've got you to admit, Putin does have a sense of humor sometimes when he says, I'll pay you what I owe you if you'll take rubles. Um, 
it's, it, and you can imagine the people who are owed that money, uh, what they think of that. But they've created it for themselves by blocking Russia's money, uh, the reserves abroad. They put them in a situation where they can't um, e even pay the interest. And yet Russia was one of the best creditors in the, re in the recent period because of the massive income from oil, gas, exports, etc. But let's move, let's move on. Joe Biden, he also has an interest in making a lot of noise at the expense of the Ukrainian people, of course. Um, Joe Biden, you remember, he was the lesser evil. He was the guy that was going to save us from terrible Trump. 53% of Americans now disapprove of Joe Biden. It's near the lowest since he was elected. He's become very unpopular. The main issue in all the questions are the economy um, at the top of people's concerns. Inflation in February hit nearly 8%. Wages year on year have actually fallen in real terms. Um, but food prices, for instance, beef has gone up 16%, pork 14% year on year. Fuel has gone up. 37 million people in America are living in, um, uh, in poverty. Over 11% of US fam families are classed as being food insecure. Um, now they've increased the rate of interest in the United States for fear of the growing inflation. Um, and this is happening in other uh, countries. Now, Britain, I'll come back to America later on. Britain is a separate discussion, which we'll have tomorrow, but 70% um, of adults in one of the latest opinion polls I, sh I saw are dissatisfied with Boris Johnson. Um, as, as I said, party gate and all the rest of it. Um, he's desperate to uh, regain his popularity. Um, just one little humorous thing I found is Boris makes a lot of noise about the evil Putin. You see, we have to spread democracy by fighting Putin. And one way of spreading democracy is to go to Saudi Arabia and try to make a deal with the regime there. And when he was asked the question, do you raise the human rights? He said, I always raise human rights issues as British prime ministers before me have done time after time. And we could add pointlessly, of course, because it has no effect. But he says, it's imagine this, it's best if the details of those conversations are kept private. They're more effective that way. Um, I don't know if he has private conversations with Putin. I, I don't understand. But um, China, as I said, um, is extremely concerned because Russia is facing a major economic decline. Europe is being pushed into recession, serious recession now. America's slowing down. The two major markets of Chinese exports in, um, in serious trouble. That means China is facing serious trouble. Its export markets are being hit. And by the way, the biggest trading partner of Ukraine also, who was it? It was China, adding to the problems. China also has a problem of overproduction uh, massive capacity that it can't utilize. And this has been producing growing instability inside China, um, the national question, but also um, the, the impact of um, the economic situation. And that also explains China's aggressive foreign policy. It's not just Russia, which is a source of instability. China has been upping the ante um, in um, Taiwan, threatening to take it back. But it's not just Taiwan. China has clashed with the Australians. They have claims on the South China Sea. They've upped their patrols around Japan. You could say that's just, they just, just like NATO when it was doing joint operations with the Ukrainians right on the border of Russia, just by chance. And then Putin reacts like this, oh, a terrible man. Um, NATO is responsible par partially for what's happening there. But the Chinese are doing the same with the Japanese. They clashed with the Indians on the Himalayas. As I said, they threatened Taiwan. They took back Hong Kong. Um, it's an aggressive foreign policy combined with a massive crackdown inside China and centralization of power in the hands of Xi Jinping because he can feel what's coming in terms of um, class struggle, instability, etc. Not so long ago, we were talking about the potential for a crisis in China. 
around the case of Evergrande, um, this huge um, um, real estate company. Um, property represents something, property and construction represents 30% of GDP in China and the crisis in that sector would massively impact the Chinese economy, which in turn would impact the world economy. Um, the, I haven't got time to go into details of the Chinese situation because I have more notes than there are minutes in this, in this lead off. Um, the situation in the Ukraine just before this war. Zelensky himself, he won the election in 2019, a little, a little bit like the five stars in Italy. He was the new guy on the block, a comedian. Uh, imagine that, that he's, he's, he's not so comical these days. Um, but he came to power promising these, the end of the poverty epoch. He was going to sort out Ukraine. He was going to make life better for people. Well, inflation year on year before this war started was at 10% in the Ukraine. Unemployment was at 10%. The poverty levels, close to 40% of the population in 2019. And in 2020, 38% of the population was saying they suffered a decline in their regular income. This was the real situation in the Ukraine, not to mention the, um, the laws banning the use of Russian, um, the uh, maneuvers of NATO and the European Union inside the Ukraine to shift the balance in their favor to get the regime they wanted, um, which produced the conflict in the Donbass, which created the, um, which built up to the present um, crisis. Um, now, what could have been done? I'm not going to go into too much detail in Ukraine because we've written a lot of articles and there's little time to go. But they all say poor Ukraine needs to defend itself. Um, but they're not prepared to actually go into Ukraine with troops. They're not even prepared to impose a no-fly zone. Now, there's a very good reason for that. You don't provoke the third world war over the Ukraine, which would threaten um, incomes, profits, the welfare of the capitalists of the world. Um, you get these smart Alex who say, well, what could they have done? What could we have done? Well, you know, there was a time when a superpower threatened a nuclear war. The only time it's ever happened in history. That superpower was the United States of America in 1962. I'm young enough to actually remember it. Um, because what I remember as a little kid was my mum and my godmother screaming, no, not another world war. They'd just been through one not long before. They were, they were terrified at the prospect of a, of, a, of a third world war. What did they do? Well, the Russians didn't put the missiles in Cuba. They pulled out. Easy. All they had to do was say, well, we'll pull out of uh, Ukraine. We will not have the Ukraine in NATO. They could have said that at the beginning. Now they're all saying it anyway, at the cost, however, of thousands of dead on both sides. And they could have made a deal. The problem, of course, is that to make a deal would mean to remove the imperialist nature of um, NATO and of the major Western um, powers. Um, so what they did is they incited little Ukraine to, um, in effect, come into conflict with Russia, not accept the demands of Russia, with the idea that, don't worry, we're behind you. When the, when the actual key moment came, they're not behind. Yeah, they might send some weapons. Send some weapons, which the only effect they'll have is, yes, make it more difficult for the Russians, which means it will draw out the war, make it longer, which means more people will be killed, more cities will be destroyed. The Ukrainian people are being played with by all the major powers. Like all small nations in conflict between the imperialist powers, they are small change that can be easily used and maneuvered. And they, they, they cry over the dead, but they, have, they are responsible for it on both sides. And we have to make that clear. At the moment, the pressure is very strong to, um, to fall for one side or the other. Nationalism is a very strong um, phenomenon in times of war. Now, the, the problem is this. It, the, the system as a whole is sick. Capitalism can no longer take society forward. 
That's what we have to understand. They cannot develop society. In fact, we're regressing. We're going backwards. Marx explained that the perspective was socialism or barbarism. What do we see in the Ukraine today if it's not the barbarism that the Marxists have always spoken about? But not just in the Ukraine, in Libya, in Iraq, in the Yemen. They don't like it, you know. Oh, why are you raising all this? We've got to think of Ukraine now. But you, Yemen, it wasn't yesterday. It's happening now too. But you're not allowed to talk about that because you see, it highlights the contradictions in which they find themselves in. The economic policies of capitalism today, I, I just listed earlier the wealth which exists on a global scale. And what are they doing? Concentrating more and more wealth in the hands of fewer, the, the few, in the meantime, we have privatization, um, austerity, pen pension cuts, increase in the AA. I don't know when the hell you guys are going to retire. You can forget it. I'm, going, I, 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 I'm next year. You guys, um, you're going to have to find some kind of longevity drug to get your pension. Housing, rent, the rent you pay today for a room in this city is absolutely scandalous considering um, the level of wages. Real income's going down, not to mention climate change, the droughts, the floods, affecting food production, etc. Not to mention the pandemic, of course, which I'm not gonna go into here. Um, but you see the levels of debt on a global scale. You see now the phenomenon of inflation, which we explained in our World Perspectives document, inflation, would reappear as a, as a consequence of the massive increase in um, um, public money being pumped into the economy, credit, etc. And and now we have the war that comes on top of that. This is producing a phenomenon which is called polarization within society. Some people are getting richer. You look during the pandemics, the rich got even richer. It's amazing how they managed to do that. The poor got poorer. Now, the story that's being spread around now is that gas has gone up because of the war. We have inflation because of the war. I remember 1974, the same story. We had inflation 25% in Britain, in Italy, and in most European countries. And whose fault was it? Oh, it was the increase in the price of oil because of the, of the war, the, the Israel-Egypt war. That, and then the oil price went up and we had the 1974 recession. It's never capitalism throughout history. It's never, it's not capitalism that creates a crisis. It's this or that or the other. Well, I'll just read something to you. This is what the governor of the Bank of England said. Well, the, the title of the article is the world economy is sleepwalking into a new financial crisis. And it starts, the world is sleepwalking towards a fresh economic and financial crisis that will have devastating consequences for the democratic market system, according to, I won't tell you it was, um, and it goes on and on. Now, he was giving that warning, you know, when this article is from, this is actually from an old lead off I did on World Perspectives over two years ago, before the pandemic started and before the war in Iraq. It's an article from The Guardian of October 2019. The crisis had already begun and it was coming and it was being prepared. It had been prepared um, and big events were flowing from that. Do you remember um, people being shot in Chile on the streets protesting or the barricades in Beirut in Lebanon? The list of movements that took place then is endless. And this was happening before the pandemic, before the war. That means there was a crisis of the system. In effect, you could say the pandemic and this war are in effect accidents through which necessity has expressed itself, i.e. the crisis of the system expresses itself in this way, but they're not the cause. They can aggravate, they can accelerate, but an existing process, um, a pre-existing process, Prior to 2020, the system was heading to a crisis um, and it's simply been accelerated, as I said. Um, the the uh, level of debt, um, just to give you some figures, 
overall debt, overall global debt in 2000 was 230% of world GDP. By 2021, it had reached 355%. It's capitalism living on borrowed time, living on credit, massively expanding the debt. At a certain point, that can no longer continue without having serious consequences in the economy and producing crisis. The world economy was already slowing down before the war um, started. I'll just give you some figures. The advanced capitalist countries were, uh, they were expecting a 5% growth last year, just under 4% this year, and 2.5% next year. Now, all, the predict all those predictions are out the window because the crisis is provoking a much more serious situation. The World Bank, um, a One World Bank uh, report from January of this year says this, social tensions may heighten as a result of the increase in inequality caused by the pandemic. But the inequality wasn't caused by the pandemic. It already existed. It was just simply made worse. Um, Germany, the powerhouse of Europe, was slowing down before this crisis came. Inflation. I gave um, a lead off just a few months ago before all this was happening. And I looked at the inflation figures just to give you some examples. Over 5% in Germany, 9% in Russia, nearly 7% in the United States. Um, but Ethiopia, 35%. Sudan, well, special case, 365%. Nigeria, over 15%. It's a long list of a significant hike in, um, in inflation in all these countries, especially food prices. Now, um, I'll just give you one example of what's happening now. Now, if you know Italy, you know that they like their pasta, which is rather nice. Some, some people don't like it. I do. For some strange reason, I like it. Well, if you double the price of pasta in just a few weeks and double the price of bread in the same period, you're asking for trouble. That's what's happening. In Italy, um, pasta, two euros a kilo. Bread, four euros a kilo. And they're expecting 15 to 30% increases on that. Fuel is shooting through the roof. Um, there's actually panic buying because people are really worried about what's going to happen. Supermarkets empty. Um, Britain, how many articles you could quote? I'll just give one from January. Guardian quoting different people complaining about life. One person, I'm not getting through the month. Um, for Britons on the cost of, uh, this, is on, this is an article on the cost of living crisis. Teachers are not getting to the end of the month. Um, food spending up one third in six months. Energy bills doubled in six months. And these are not, the end, you know, the, the bottom of the ladder, um, uh, social layers. Some of them are like store managers, teachers. Um, in Britain, in the United Kingdom, um, in 2022, average family will be hit by about 1,200 pounds cut in their um, purchasing power because of all of this. Further afield, in the colonial countries, ex-colonial countries, the increase in the price of grain and let's remember, Russia and Ukraine combined produce 30% of the world's grain. Um, this is going to massively affect the supplies. Countries like Egypt, Lebanon and others depend heavily on Russian and Ukrainian imports. Um, the war is going to massively affect that. Massive increases in prices. Let's not forget, the last time this happened, that lead off from two or three years ago, we were talking about 40 countries across the world affected by mass protests because of the increase in, um, in food prices. It was also a strong element in the Arab Spring of 2011. Um, in the meantime, the uh, wages falling behind inflation massively, leading to the point where the director of the International Labour Organization, a guy called Guy Ryder, Talking about the pandemic, he said the growth in inequality created by the COVID-19 crisis threatens a legacy of poverty um, and social and economic instability that would be devastating. This 
was before the war in the Ukraine. Now, Lenin explained that capitalism can always find a way out of a crisis. Now, does that mean that we might as well just give up? Because if capitalism can find a solution to its crisis, what's the point? The point is that each solution has a problem. And the, the way they, they, they rode out the crisis during the pandemic with the massive increase in um, public um, stimulus is now producing the inflation that we're seeing. And this is going to be an important factor in the situation that we've entered. Because you see, you can be a moderate, you can be a worker that says, well, as long as I keep my head down, I'll do what the boss tells me to do. He asks me for that extra hour, I'll do it. As long as I get my wages, pay the rent, pay the mortgage, feed my kids. When you have inflation in a country like Turkey, which is now inflation is reaching 60%, workers in Turkey are going on strike for 30, 40% wage increases. You could say terrible, greedy workers. Not enough to keep up with the rate of inflation. That explains the spate of strikes across Turkey the last um, few months. Um, it explains um, the militancy in other parts of the world. Back to the United States. In the United States, inflation is 7, 8%, and they think it could even get up to 10%. They're talking about the new buzzword, which not, it's not a new buzzword, it was when I was a kid, stagflation. Stagnation combined with inflation. It's coming back. Um, wage increases are not enough to keep up with the pace of inflation. In the 70s, it was always inflation is provoked by workers going on strike and demanding wage increases. They, they always get it the wrong way around, of course. They ignore the fact that it's inflation, which makes life intolerable for ordinary working class people, which means even the most moderate worker, the worker that yesterday would keep his head down and try and avoid conflict with the boss, are the first to come out on strike if you call one, because they cannot afford to live on the wages um, they have. In America, last year, in private industry, workers won average wage increases of 4.3%. That's the highest level of wage increases in the United States for 20 years. You'd think, wow, fantastic. American workers must be doing really well. Not so, because inflation is far higher than that. So in reality, we have something like a two, 3% cut in real purchasing power of American workers' wages. Last year, there was in fact a strike wave in the United States of America. But you might think, well, only 11% of US workers are actually in a union. So if there's not many workers in a union, how can there be so many strikes? Well, I've got news for people who talk like that. May 68 in France took place with a much lower percentage of workers in, in the unions. And yet 10 million workers came out on strike and occupied the factories in May 68. Um, another interesting detail, 65% of Americans approve of trade unions. That's the highest figure since 1965. But amongst young people in America, in the age bracket 18 to 29, 78% approve of trade unions. They're not members, but they approve. Why do you approve? Why approve of the union? Because you need one. You need the unions. You need organization to defend yourself in a situation like this. A similar tendency is taking place in Britain. You look at the strike. Oh, the civilized way they deal with workers in Britain, by the way. When they, when they say that going to war, we spread democracy and human rights, tell that to the PO workers and what happened to them in this nice democratic country. But so critical is the situation in the United States that you have professors, uh, this is quoted in the New York Times in January, um, title of the article, talking about the United States, is a civil war looming or should we calm down? And it quotes Barbara Walter, political science professor, at the University of California in San Diego. She's written a book about how civil wars start. She takes 
the experience of Burma, Northern Ireland, Rwanda, Sri Lanka, Syria, Yugoslavia. And what does she do? She looks at the common threads and then says, hmm, we have all this in the United States of America. This is the kind of analysis which is now being produced. Britain, I don't want to go into it. We have um, the leader of Unite uh, writing an article in Tribune in December. We must build popular working class power. That's a British trade unionist. Um, I, I mentioned Turkey already. Um, if you want to have a glimpse of what we can expect in the next period in one country after another, it's enough to remember a little detail which has been forgotten. What happened in Kazakhstan at the beginning of this year? If you saw the insurrectionary movement that took place in that country. And the significant thing was the massive participation of the working class in that movement. Oil workers, gas workers, miners, metal workers. These were the sectors involved. What kind of wage increases were they demanding? Well, the oil workers were demanding 100% wage increase and greater trade union rights. Um, general strike that affected the country. But you see, Kazakhstan also brings home something else. Yes, immense potential for revolution, but also what happens when there's no leadership? No leadership and the class, the working class of Kazakhstan was in effect defeated. Putin also played a role there, spreading his, um, his influence in, um, in, in that country. Now, you see, all this is happening and all this is having a huge effect on people's consciousness. That's what we've got to understand. Wars, economic crisis, all of this is making million, billions of people actually um, think. Remember, the First World War produced revolution, not just in Russia, but in Hungary in 1919, in Italy in 1920, the German working class several times could have taken power. Then the Spanish Civil War, the French sit down strikes, the occupation of the factories. 20 years of revolution was unleashed by the First World War. The Second World War, a little bit different, but, un, but also the Civil War in Greece, the resistance in Italy, the resistance in France, the Chinese Revolution, the Indian movement for independence, the, colon the colonies, uh, revolted against the imperialist powers. Um, that's what war tends to produce. And we are living now in a, an epoch of war and revolution. Millions of ordinary working class people are asking themselves, where are we going with this? What, what's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen in six months time? And we're having huge shifts in the recent period, the last four, five, six years, we saw a glimpse of the potential. When half a million people joined the Labour Party because of Jeremy Corbyn, what were they trying to join? Were they trying to join a wishy-washy reformist party that compromises with the right wing and refuses to um, um, take over the party and implement um, deselection and all the rest of it? No, they were looking at what they thought was a radical change in the Labour Party, a party that talked about the, work, the genuine interests of the working class and for genuine social change. In Spain, hundreds of thousands joined Podemos. In France, hundreds of thousands turned out to listen to Mélenchon. In America, stadiums were filled by Bernie Sanders, who appeared as a socialist, so um, a democratic socialist, um, and so on and so forth. We saw an attempt by the working class to find a political expression at a time of crisis. Because the reformist leadership was in place, incapable of offering a way out, that period receded for a period of time. The Labour Party is now in the hands of the right wing. Podemos is what it is. Uh, Bernie Sanders is completely behind Biden. They've, they've tried to close that channel of um, that could express the anger and the radicalization of the working class. But all they've done is create a situation where the tension is building up to a much greater degree than before, 
preparing new and bigger movements of, um, of the working class. Um, sorry, I've got to skip through. You see, comrades, as Marxists, how many times do we say it? Conditions determine consciousness. The same person that you talk to today will have a different opinion tomorrow, depending on what happens to them, depending on the conditions around them. And the conditions are changing dramatically. The inflation is eating into, into um, families' um, incomes, the ability to feed their kids, the ability to pay the rent. I was watching Italian TV and they were going around the markets and the supermarkets, asking questions to people and saying, they're even having to choose what vegetables to buy. They can't, this is terrible. They can't go out for a pizza anymore because they're getting expensive. Um, but apart from the jokes, the conditions are in steep decline. People are suffering, materially suffering. And with that comes a change in consciousness, comrades. You can feel it, you can touch it. Everybody you talk to is talking about this. Millions of people are talking about that, the war. But they're also talking about inflation, the, the fact that they can't afford to live. That means class struggle is on the agenda. We saw it in Turkey. We saw it in the United States. We're seeing it in Britain. The PNO is just, just one more example on top of all the other, other strikes. And it's beginning to spread to other parts of the world, to other countries. And what we have to understand is what is in front of us is this scenario. But we have to learn from history, comrades. Learn the lessons of the past. Why do we have all these books here? I was looking at them. You see, you can't sell them to me because I've got all of them. <laughs> I just don't have the latest introduction. Um, why? Because in these books, you will find the history of the working class, the history of capitalism. You'll have a philosophical explanation, a materialist scientific explanation of why society is where it is, but also the history of the working class and its ability to rise up, to fight, to try to change society. But also, unfortunately, where there isn't a leadership, where there isn't a party, that energy which builds up to a head and erupts in huge movements of the working class can also be lost. And remember this, comrades, you have certain people talking today about the Third World War. Now we know it's not on the cards. It's not in the interests of the capitalists and the objective conditions don't exist for it. But you look at some of the politicians in the Ukraine, by the way, poor little Ukraine. I heard the deputy prime minister on TV yesterday demanding the no-fly zone be imposed, um, shaming the Europeans for not imposing it, basically saying, I don't give a damn if I drag the whole world down into utter barbarism and destruction, because that's what it means. Now, that's not the short-term perspective, but remember, in the long run, either we build an organization that is capable of giving the working class the leadership that it deserves, or the working class will face defeat. It will rise up and it will be defeated, it will rise up again and it will be defeated. Eventually, that cannot go on forever. And, and at some point, the solution to that crisis is, becomes a reactionary one. That's the long-term perspective. And we need to keep that in mind, comrades, when we have our branch meetings and we have our theoretical discussions, when we have our reading groups, when you sit at home reading that book, when you're out on the streets selling those papers, raising the money, there's a purpose to it. It's to build the organization to intervene in this dramatic new world which presents itself to us. It's up to us, comrades, forward, build the organization.